He who could not be slain, He who commanded the sun and moon to cease, He who parted the Jordan River, and He who crumbled the walls of Jericho. This is the story of Joshua, who succeeded Moses, and of his mission to lead the Israelites into the land of inheritance. This video is made with the goal to entice people to read the works within the Bible so that they may follow more closely the Word of God. If you enjoyed the contents of this video, please remember to like, and if you would want to see more, subscribe. Joshua is the translated name of Yahushua. The meaning of his name is Yahweh is salvation. For the uninitiated, Yahweh is the name of the Lord God. When the Lord revealed himself to Moses, Within the burning bush he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. The time of the burning bush was before the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. Joshua was a fellow slave within Egypt during this period and would be a part of the original people who the Lord led out of the country by a cloud during the day and by a pillar of fire during the night. Exodus contains the establishing and then the re-establishing of the Ten Commandments. During these events Joshua is present. He accompanied Moses when he ascended Mount Sinai and when he returned to the news of the Israelites celebrating around the golden calf. And two, Joshua is seen as a custodian of the tabernacle, working under Moses upon its completion. Although Joshua's presence is not at the forefront within Exodus, his involvement with Moses and the Lord foreshadows his later importance and role within the Lord's plans. Within the Book of Numbers, the succeeding book to Exodus, during the journey through the wilderness, the Lord commanded Moses to send the Israelites into Canaan to inherit their promised land. Moses chose twelve men, each the head of the tribes of the children of Israel. Within this selection was Joshua, the son of his father Nun, of the tribe of Ephraim. However, Yahushua was not his name at this time, it was Oshea. Before departing, Moses blessed Oshea with his new name and meaning, and then sent the twelve spies into Canaan for a forty-day reconnaissance. The objective, to see if the people are strong, weak, few or many whether the land be good or bad, and what cities they dwell within, whether in tents or in strongholds. After the forty-day reconnaissance into Canaan, the scouts returned. The news was both good and bad for the people of Israel. The land flowed with milk and honey, just as the Lord promised, but its people were fearsome. The spies spotted giants amongst them, the children of Anak, who made the men feel like grasshoppers in their presence. The subject of the Nephilim and the descendants of biblical giants I have already covered in a separate video. Within, the issue of the Israelites' faith in the Lord at this time was addressed. To touch upon it again, Numbers chapter 14 reads, And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land, to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain, and let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land, and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us, their defence is departed from them, and the Lord is with us, fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. 
Joshua and Caleb were only two of the ten spies who remained faithful in the Lord. They attempted to plead with the people, and the reaction they received was almost of deadly stone. The Lord, in response to the people's cowardice and conspiring, announces that the current generation shall be cursed to wander the wilderness until they have passed on and perished. Only their children shall know the sweet and savory gifts of the promised inheritance, along with Joshua and Caleb. The Israelites wandered the wilderness for a further 38 years, making it 40 years in total. Nearing the end of their sentence, the Lord calls upon Moses. Due to Moses disobeying the Lord's commandments when the people were thirsty in the wilderness, the Lord forbade Moses from entering into the promised land. He was to die atop Mount Nebo, overlooking Canaan's borders. However, before that occurred, Moses requested that a man be set over the congregation so that the Lord's sheep may have a shepherd. Chapter 27 reads, And Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him, and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. And thou shalt put some of thine honour upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. At his word shall they go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. With Joshua, anointed as head over Israel, we move to the following book within the Bible, Deuteronomy. Chapters 1 to 30 of the book consist of three sermons or speeches delivered to the Israelites by Moses on the plains of Moab, shortly before they enter the Promised Land. The first sermon recounts the 40 years of wilderness wanderings which had led to that moment and ended with an exhortation to observe the law. The second sermon reminds the Israelites of the need to follow Yahweh and the laws or teachings he has given them on which their possession of the land depends. The third sermon offers the comfort that even should the nation of Israel prove unfaithful and so lose the land, with repentance all can be restored. With the third speech at a close, Moses had this left to say to the people of Israel, I am an hundred and twenty years old this day. I can no more go out and come in. Also the Lord hath said unto me, Thou shalt not go over this Jordan. The Lord thy God, he will go over before thee, and he will destroy these nations from before thee, and thou shalt possess them. And Joshua, he shall go over before thee, as the Lord hath said. And the Lord shall do unto them as he did to Sion and to Og, kings of the Amorites, and unto the land of them whom he destroyed. And the Lord shall give them up before your face, that ye may do unto them according unto all the commandments which I have commanded you. Be strong and of a good courage, fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And Moses called unto Joshua, and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of a good courage. For thou must go with this people unto the land which the Lord hath sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. Moses then wrote all that he had said all the commandments of God's law, and delivered it to the priests, the sons of Levi, which bore the Ark of the Covenant, and to the elders of Israel. Moses then travelled from the plains of Moab, atop Mount Nebo, over against Jericho. The Lord then showed Moses all the land in which the children of Israel were to inherit, and there he passed, according to the words of the Lord. And Moses slept with his fathers, and they buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, but no man knows of his resting place to this day. With the death of Moses, the book of Deuteronomy comes to an end. There since arose no prophet for Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. The events during the time of Moses deserves its own video. However, to briefly address those events, the passing of leadership between Moses and Joshua is at the time 
a foreshadowing of things to come. Joshua shares his name with another. The importance to differentiate the two is seen within the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. As when Joshua is mentioned, his father's name is too. This is because Yahushua is the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Biblical scholars have viewed Joshua as an Old Testament representation of the promised Messiah. Moses, who established and represented the law, was unable to fulfill it. Whilst Joshua achieved to lead the people, conquer their enemies, and settle in the promised land. Joshua's accomplishments point to the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, the defeat of God's enemy, Satan, and the setting free of all believers from captivity to sin, opening the way into the promised land of heaven. The book of Joshua, the succeeding book to Deuteronomy, begins with the Lord speaking to Joshua. Chapter 1 reads, Moses my servant is dead, now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. The Lord then instructs Joshua to be strong and full of courage, that he must observe to do according to the law, which Moses commanded him and Israel. He says to not turn from the Lord, to neither go from the right or to the left, but keep moving forwards, as the Lord has already paved the road ahead. Joshua then commands the officers of the people, informing them to tell the people to prepare to move in three days' time. They are soon to pass over the Jordan River and go into the Promised Land to possess it. During this interim, Joshua sent two men to spy the city of Jericho. The two entered the city, discreetly, and lodged at a harlot's house. The name of the woman was Rahab, and when the king of Jericho sent his men to investigate her house, after reports of two Israelites entering the city, she hid them away. She informed the king that the men left about the time of the shutting of the gate, and that if they wished to catch them, they must hurry. Once the king's men had gone, she unveiled the Israelites and said, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when ye came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side Jordan, Sion, and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that ye will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token, and that ye will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. The men of Israel accepted her plea and promised to spare her and her family. But if she told anyone of the pact, then it would become broken and she and her family would be destroyed when Israel laid siege to the city. Rahab then let the men down via a cord through the window as her house was upon the wall. The men instructed her to bind the scarlet line which that they had just traveled down above the window when Israel returned to invade, so to inform all who pass of the pact and of those that dwell within the house. For those familiar with the Old Testament, this should be symbolic of the Passover in Egypt. When the enslaved Israelites dwelt within the land the night before their departure, they painted lamb's blood above their door, informing the angel of death which houses not to target. Not only does the scarlet cord harken back to Egypt, but the symbolism of the men being dependent on the red stripe is also how, through Christ, we are dependent on the red stripes that he shed upon the cross on the day of his crucifixion. The two men returned from Jericho and said to Joshua, 
Truly the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land, for even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. Joshua and the people then removed themselves from their current lodgings and came to Jordan. There the officers went and informed the people that when the time has come to follow the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Joshua then instructed the children of Israel to sanctify themselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders amongst them. The Lord then spoke to Joshua, saying, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And thou shalt command the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in Jordan. Joshua then gathered the children of Israel and said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Hivites, and the Perizzites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you into Jordan. Now therefore take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe a man, and it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon an heap. The next day the priests entered the Jordan River, and as soon as they that bore the ark touched the brim of the water, the waters departed from them, and stood as a heap on either side. The priest remained firm on the dry ground of the riverbed, whilst all Israel passed clean over the Jordan. This crossing is symbolic to the Saviour from judgment. Israel peered from one bank to the next, where across the flooded river, their promised land, their heaven on earth, awaited. The river waters backed up upon a town called Adam and continued to be pushed down to the Dead Sea. It is because of the actions within the Garden of Eden that Adam and Eve were cut off from paradise on earth. Now God's children return to the presence of the Lord. The waters are halted when the mercy seat, throne of Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, touches the face of the water. The waters of judgment, which flows from Adam, is blocking the church, the people of the Lord, from returning to heaven. Only through Christ can judgment be stopped. Only through Jesus can we be saved from being swallowed by sin. Only through the Son of God, named the second Adam, can we return to the presence of the Lord. Continuing, the Lord said to Joshua, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priests' feet stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men, whom he had prepared of the children of Israel, out of every tribe a man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. The people did as Joshua instructed, and that day the Lord magnified him in the sight of all Israel. They feared him as they did Moses all the days of his life, and soon the enemies of Israel, who were on the westward side of Jordan, heard of what the Lord had done for his people. All the kings of the Amorites and the Canaanites were deathly afraid of the Lord. After the crossing, Israel encamped in a place named Gilgal, and whilst Joshua was in the plains of Jericho, he lifted up his eyes to see a man stood over him, sword drawn. And Joshua said, Art thou for us, or for our adversaries? The figure replied, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and did worship, 
and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. With the ending of chapter 5, Joshua's experiences again replicate the similar events seen within the life of Moses. When the burning bush appeared before Moses, he was commanded to take off his sandals, as the ground where he stood was a holy place. With the figure announcing himself as captain of the Lord's host, this has spawned many theories surrounding the identity of this being. Joshua is either bowing in respect of the being's rank, or he is bowing because the Lord himself stands before him. It is my belief that the being before Joshua is the Lord our God, in the pre-incarnate image of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. He is, as he said, the captain of host, the host of heaven, and the host of Israel. The need for Joshua to remove his sandals cements this belief within me as angels of the Lord appear before people later in history, and there is no need or mention of the removing of sandals in these instances. Chapter 6 begins with, Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valour. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns, and the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass, that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. As instructed, Joshua commanded the people, headed by the priests who bore the ark, to circle the city of Jericho for seven days. The significance of the number seven is further felt, as seven priests held seven trumpets and were to sound them whilst encircling the city. What is it with the importance of the number seven? The Lord God created heaven and all the earth in six days, and on the seventh he rested. Later, the Israelites would rest on the seventh day of the week, called the Sabbath. On every seventh year the Israelites were to cancel all debts they had made with each other and give up their servants. And in the New Testament Christ spoke seven times whilst on the cross. These are not the only times the number seven has appeared within the Bible. But through these examples you can see how the importance extends from the Lord to his people and to his son. To answer the question, the number seven then represents fulfillment of promises and oaths, rest, and healing. For six days the Israelites circled the city, returning to their camps after each time. They never once shouted, as instructed, only the sounds of their trumpets bellowed over Jericho's walls, and on the seventh day they rose early and again encompassed the city. However, this time after the sounding of the horns, Joshua said, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. The people shouted with the last roar of the trumpets, and the wall fell flat and the Israelites stormed the city and took it. Rahab and her family were spared, as promised, and with their leave, the city's valuables were taken, and their idols, along with the city, were burnt. And so, with the battle won, the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame soared over and throughout all the country. Joshua's conquest is far from over, as in chapter 8 the Lord says to Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee, and arise, go up to Ai. See, I have given into thy hand the king of Ai, and his people, and his city, and his land. And thou shalt do to Ai and her king, as thou didst unto Jericho and her king. Only the spoil thereof, and the cattle thereof, shall ye take for a prey unto yourselves. Lay thee an ambush for the city behind it, so Joshua arose and all the people of war to go up against Ai, and Joshua chose out thirty thousand mighty men of valour and sent them away by night. And he commanded them, saying, Behold, ye shall lie in wait against the city, even behind the city. 
Go not very far from the city, but be ye all ready. And I, and all the people that are with me, will approach unto the city, and it shall come to pass, when they come out against us, as at the first, that we will flee before them, for they will come out after us, till we have drawn them from the city, for they will say, They flee before us, as at the first, therefore we will flee before them. Then ye shall rise up from the ambush and seize upon the city, for the Lord your God will deliver it into your hand. The following morning Joshua rose up early, numbered the people, and set off towards Ai. They came before the city and pitched on the northern side, with a valley between them and their target. He then chose five thousand men to lie in ambush on the western side, before travelling down into the midst of the valley. The king of Ai peered from his keep in the morning hours and saw Israel encamped on the plain of the valley. The king then set his army out from the city, and Israel fled, to give chase. The king and all his people believed they fled out of fear, and so hastened after them. None the wiser of the men Joshua had left on either side of the city. There was not a man left in Ai, all went out after Israel, and they left the city gates open. And the Lord said to Joshua, Stretch out the spear that is in thy hand toward Ai, for I will give it into thine hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that he had in his hand toward the city, and the ambush arose quickly out of their place, and they ran as soon as he had stretched out his hand, and they entered into the city, and took it, and hasted, and set the city on fire. And when the men of Ai looked behind them, they saw, and behold, the smoke of the city ascended up to heaven, and they had no power to flee this way or that way, and the people that fled to the wilderness turned back upon the pursuers. And when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city, and that the smoke of the city ascended, then they turned again and slew the men of Ai. With the city reduced to smouldering rubble, the king of Ai was hanged. In the evening he was taken down and cast at the front of the city gates, where a great heap of stones was raised. It came to pass that all the kings on the westward side of Jordan, who were in the hills and in the valleys and even along all the coasts, heard the victories of the Israelites. And so the kings of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites and the Jebusites gathered themselves together to fight Joshua as one. Moving forward in time, in response to Joshua making peace with the Gibeonites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish and Eglon marched their armies on Gibeon to smite them. The men of Gibeon came to Joshua to Camp Gilgal and said, Slack not thy hand from thy servants, come up to us quickly and save us and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. And the Lord said to Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand, there shall not a man of them stand before thee. And the Lord discomfited them before Israel, and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, and chased them along the way that goeth up to Bethoron, and smote them to Azekah and unto Machedah. And it came to pass, as they fled from before Israel, and were in the going down to Bethoron, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died. They were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou, moon, in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day, and there was no day like that before it or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. Joshua's exploits continued, and he and the Israelites killed the remaining kings, and took their cities, burning, but also saving some others. Chapter 11 ends with the verse, announcing this victory. So Joshua took the whole land, according to all that the Lord said unto Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel, according to their divisions by their tribes, and the land rested from war. Chapter 12 lists all who Israel had conquered. 
kings from both sides of the Jordan River, fell at the hands of the children of Israel. Giant nor man, it mattered not. All toppled under the judgment of the Lord, carried out through his chosen people. The book of Joshua is split between unification and then division. The first twelve chapters tell the story of the conquest, and then the final twelve tell the story of how the land was allotted between the twelve tribes. The latter half of the book deserves its own dedicated video to fully explain and go in detail how the land was allotted and how Israel changed because of that. The speech Joshua gives towards the end of his life to the people of Israel is too best saved separately. As his concern for the people and how they might act and what they may become can certainly be felt. All of Joshua's conquests and the details thereof were not included within this video. The reason, to purposely select events from the first 12 chapters to show you the viewer how the Lord was with him and how through him the way was carved and conquered for the people. I encourage you to pick up your own Bible and read through this period in history yourself so that you come to understand and fully appreciate the Lord. On the subject of appreciation, it would appear that after all had settled and that there were no more wars to win, Joshua faded into obscurity. Joshua's life was one of melancholy. He shined amidst the dark, but once all had burned away, he was left dim. He had fought in countless battles, even into his elderly years. The Spirit of the Lord was with him and made him feel youthful, yet he was somewhat alone in his victory. He was one of only two to inherit the promised land. All those who belonged to his generation perished in the wilderness. Now with this new generation, who were most detached from the exodus of Egypt, he led them into new lands where they had power and were not oppressed. Their children, who would now grow up in the lands they had won, would know not what it is to live as bondmen, and two, how to live like warriors. They had inherited the prize and the peace that went with it. But with peace comes complacency and forgetfulness. Fading memories of how the Lord fought for his children, how he freed them from slavery, how he crumbled cities, how he held still the sun, moon and stars, and how he showed them mercy when they were wicked in his sight. Joshua died alone at the age of 110. He was buried in a place called Har Gash. The mountain, slopes of a volcano in which he was buried in, has been ascribed to God's anger at the ingratitude the people had towards Joshua, now all had settled. That whilst they were busy tending to their gardens and their vineyards, Joshua's funeral was void of life, empty of the people who he had fought for. As mentioned in the beginning of this video, the aim is to get you interested in the works of the Bible. If your interest has been piqued, then please read the original text yourself. If you have additional commentary on Joshua and the events discussed within this video, then please leave a comment. I look forward to reading them. If you wish to support the work I do here on this channel, please see my Patreon. On that note, thank you to my patrons and channel members. I am blessed to have your support. If you enjoyed, please remember to like and subscribe, as it helps the channel immensely. God bless and goodbye.